Thank you, Joe. And, and now we, we've worked out the secret to how Joe got Hannah, not just through his five, five cent tithe, but 10 cent after 10 cent after 10 cent offering brought him the woman of his dreams. How good's that? I knew a lady once that she was so desperate for God's choice for her as a husband, she started to double tithe for her husband, double tithe for her husband. So um, she did that under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that may not be for all of you to do. May I ask you to triple tithe? <laughs> but, uh, but she double tithe, and, so, and she got this most amazing man, and it was so good. So we're talking about today when God shows up, and to set the background and the tone, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, about Luke, the author. We're going to talk about when the book was written. We're going to go into some background. But to do that effectively and to make that a little bit tighter and cram some more information in, got this really great video that we're going to start off with about when God, God shows up. It's the first part. It's Acts, starting with Acts 1 to 12. And then the next video we'll show next week, Acts uh, 13 to 28. So sit back and enjoy this video, and it's going to set the tone for the message today. Thank you. It's the second volume of a unified two-part work that today we call Luke-Acts. These were written by the same author, Luke, who was a traveling co-worker with Paul. This we'll is just clear start from that again a bit louder, thanks. Where Luke thanks. says, I produced my first volume. A bit louder. It's hard to get the, when they're hidden. The book of Acts. There. It's the second volume of a unified two-part work that today we call Luke-Acts. These were written by the same author, Luke, who was a traveling co-worker with Paul. This is clear from the book's introduction, where Luke says, I produced my first volume, that's the gospel, about all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. Now Luke's giving a clue here as to what this book of Acts will be about. Volume 1 was about what Jesus began to do and to teach. Volume 2 will then be about what Jesus continued to do and teach. Which leads to a really interesting point about the book's traditional but not original name, the Acts of the Apostles. While different apostles do appear in most of these stories, the only single character who unifies the whole story from beginning to end is Jesus himself, acting directly or through the Spirit. And so the book would more accurately be named The Acts of Jesus and the Spirit. The book's introduction recounts how the risen Jesus spends some 40 days with the disciples, teaching them about the kingdom of God. This connects back to the story of Luke's gospel, where Jesus claimed that he was restoring God's kingdom over the world, beginning with Israel. So he called Israel to live under God's reign by following him. And he was enthroned as king when he gave up his life and then conquered death with his love. And so the book of Acts begins with the risen King Jesus instructing his disciples about life in his kingdom. So he promises that the Spirit will soon come and immerse them in his personal presence. And this fulfills one of the key hopes from the Old Testament prophets, that in the Messianic kingdom, God's presence, his Spirit, would come and take up residence among his people in a new temple and transform their hearts. And so Jesus says, when this happens, the Spirit will empower his disciples to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. From here, Jesus is taken up from their sight in a cloud. It's an image drawn from the book of Daniel, chapter 7. It shows how Jesus is now being enthroned as the Son of Man, who was vindicated after his suffering and now shares in God's rule over the world. And so he promises that he will return one day. And so the main themes and the design of the book of Acts flow right out of this opening chapter. This is a story about Jesus leading his people by the Spirit to go out into the world and invite all nations to live under his reign. And so the story will begin with that message spreading in Jerusalem and then into the neighboring regions of Judea and Samaria full of non-Jewish people, and then from there out to all of the nations into the ends of the earth. This video is just going to focus on the first half of the book. So the Jerusalem-focused section begins with Jesus' followers waiting until the Feast of Pentecost when all of these Jewish pilgrims from all over the ancient world were in the city. 
And the Holy Spirit comes on the disciples as a great wind, and something like flames appear over each person's head, and together they start announcing and telling stories of God's mighty deeds. And they're speaking in all of these languages that they didn't know before, but all the people gathered there understand perfectly. Now, in order to see what Luke's emphasizing in this story, it's crucial to see the Old Testament roots of all of these images. So first, the wind and the fire is a direct allusion to the stories about God's glorious fiery presence filling the tabernacle and the temple. And it's also connected to the prophetic promises that God would come and live by his spirit in the new temple of the messianic kingdom. And so here in Acts, God's fiery presence comes to dwell not in a building, but in his people. Luke is saying that the new temple promised by the prophets is Jesus' new covenant family, the people of Jesus, which connects to the second thing Luke is trying to say here. So the prophets promised that when God came to dwell in his new temple, he would reunify all the tribes of Israel under the messianic king, and that the good news of God's reign would go out and be announced to the nations. Luke describes in detail the international multi-tribe makeup of all of the Israelites who were there at Pentecost and who responded to Peter's message. And so the apostles keep calling Israelites to acknowledge Jesus as their Messiah, and thousands upon thousands respond, forming new communities of generosity and worship and celebration. But not everybody's celebrating. From here, Luke shows how Jesus' new family quickly faced hostility from the Jerusalem leaders. With a really beautiful symmetrical design, Luke tells a tale of two temples. So God's new temple, the community of Jesus' followers, they're gathering every day in the temple courts and from house to house. Now, in between those notices are two stories about Peter and the other apostles healing people in the temple courts, only to get arrested by the temple leaders, followed each time by a speech of Peter claiming that Jesus is the true king of Israel. And at the center of all this is a story about Jesus' followers donating property and possessions to a common fund to help the poor, which is really cool. But it seems kind of random for Luke to mention it here until you realize that this was a practice described in the laws of the Torah and was supposed to be happening through the Jerusalem temple and its leaders. So Luke's point here is clear. The new temple of Jesus' community is fulfilling the purpose that God always intended for the Jerusalem temple, to be a place where heaven and earth meet, where people encounter God's generosity and healing presence. And this conflict between the two temples, it culminates in Acts chapter 6 and 7. It's the first wave of persecution. So Jesus' followers, they continue to multiply, requiring more leaders. And one of these, Stephen, he's a bold witness for Jesus in Jerusalem. And he ends up getting arrested, and he's accused of speaking against and even threatening the temple. And so Stephen here gives a long speech showing how Israel's leaders have always rejected the messengers. God sent them, including Jesus, and now his disciples. So the Jerusalem leaders are enraged. They murder Stephen, and they launch a wave of persecution against Jesus' followers that drives most of them from the city. But it has a paradoxical effect. Luke shows how this tragedy actually became the means by which Jesus' people are now sent out into Judea and Samaria. Now in this section, Luke has collected a diverse group of stories that all show how the mostly Jewish, Jerusalem-based community of Jesus became a multi-ethnic international movement. So first is the mission of Philip into Samaria. It's the land of Israel's hated enemies, and many of them come to follow Jesus. Next we have the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, later known as Paul. He was the sworn enemy and persecutor of Jesus' followers until he personally met the risen Jesus, and he then became a passionate advocate on behalf of Jesus. Next is the story of Peter having a vision about how God doesn't consider non-Jewish people ritually impure or unworthy of joining Jesus' family. And so Peter, he's led by the Spirit into the house of a Roman soldier, full of non-Jewish people, and they all respond to the good news about Jesus. In fact, the Spirit shows up powerfully upon them, just as he did to the Jewish disciples back in chapter 2. These themes all come together in the founding of the church in Antioch, the largest, most cosmopolitan city in that part of the Roman Empire. And Luke, he tells us that Barnabas, a Jewish leader from the Jerusalem church, went along with Paul to help lead this church community. 
And so it became the first large multi-ethnic church in history. It was where Jesus' followers were called Christians for the first time. And it's from here that the first international missionaries were sent out. And so we see Jesus' commission coming true, and this takes us into the rest of Luke's story. But for now, that's the first half of the book of Acts. Good, hey? It's good. Brings us up to speed. So, got a bit of background to go through. Got a lot of scripture I want to go through. But we're going to get some valuable insight at the same time. So, but before we do that, I wanted to read to you Proverbs 27.7. Proverbs 27.7. Just up on the back screen there. It says, When you are full, you will refuse honey. But when you are hungry... Even bitter food tastes sweet. What we need to make sure, whatever we do as a church and as Christians, is that we live in a society that complains almost about everything. I believe Australia is starting to get a really well-known tag as a nation of whingers. We whinge about so much. We whinge about ball tampering. We whinge about the latest thing that happened on Facebook. I see so many people put on Facebook and they whinge and complain about the ref was unfair and they lost the game for the team and and so much. And I see it, it creeps into our church. And I've noticed one thing, that people that complain the least are the ones that fit into the second part of this scripture But when you are hungry, even bitter food tastes sweet. If I have fasted for 7 days, 13 days, 40 days, someone can put the most average food on the table and I can eat of it and it tastes most amazing. And I've shared this story before and and maybe I I, I might just do it now because it's going to bring some light hardness in and it's going to put a reflection onto who I am potentially used to be with my brashness but I remember you remember this pastor dawn and maybe not the way I do maybe with a little bit more sort of angst I don't know but imagine this a young man invited into a pastor's house and the young man and the pastor's daughter start to develop an interest into each other and I've gone there for dinner and the pastor's daughter has created this beautiful meal a chicken dish a beautiful meal, and I'm sitting there, we're eating it all, and this pastor's daughter, she is so desperate to seek the approval of the young man that has entered their home through good food. If I can present a good meal, maybe I'm worth marrying one day. And so we're eating this meal, and then with great anticipation, she asks the dangerous question, how is the meal? So as any good God-fearing young man, trying to impress God first, like Joe preached all about in the offering. I, I, you can tell I'm, this is going to go sideways really bad. And so I said, the flavor's really good, the presentation's really good, but the chicken is a little bit dry. This is what, in front of the mother, the father, the brothers, and Hannah was too young to remember. So adult stuff happening there so the pin dropped everybody heard it and you could just hear it and then I kind of never heard the end of it at the dinner table and being a young man I just wanted it to stop I wanted it to stop I I gave my honest opinion the chicken was a little bit dry for whatever reason we blamed the oven and it went on for a little bit so I said something that was probably Slightly offensive, maybe. (laughs) Slightly offensive, probably a lot more. I said to the table and I said to my wife-to-be, I said, well, because to me food is food. Like you eat it, you live, you move on. If it's cold, it's cold. If it's hot, it's hot. You drink, your coffee's cold. Drink it, get on with it. Go and bless people. So young man, frame of mind. So I said, well, if you're going to be that way, I said this, verbatim, I would not even feed this. (laughs) 
to my Simba dog. Pray for my wife that that never, never rises up again. But see, when you're hungry, you even eat dry chicken, okay? When you're hungry, you will, you will do things. You will hunger after God and you'll put up with a lot. And so we're after a church that is not so full of everything that they miss the next move of God. We're after a church that is so hungry for the things of God that they will seek God. And when things don't appear to go our own way, we keep seeking God until God shows up. And I've noticed that in my life, same in the book of Acts, that the apostles would have expected God to turn up one way, but God kept on turning up another way. And so with the book of Acts, it's all about Jesus sending the Holy Spirit to empower His disciples as they carry the good news of His kingdom to the nations of the world. Who wrote the book? As we know, Luke wrote the book, and it was unquestioned throughout ancient times. It shows a clear progression from the gospel according to Luke, picking up just where that book left off. An ancient prologue to Luke's gospel indicates that Luke was first a follower of the apostles and then became close with Paul. Luke was a doctor. And it was written about 60, 62 AD. Why is the book of Acts so important? Acts is the only biblical book that chronicles the history of the church immediately after Jesus' ascension. As such, it provides us with a valuable account of how the church was able to grow and spread out from Jerusalem into the rest of the Roman Empire. In only three decades, say three decades, in only three decades, a small group of frightened believers in Jerusalem transformed into an empire-wide movement of people who had committed their lives to Jesus Christ, ending on a high note with Paul on the verge of taking the gospel to the highest government official in the land, the Emperor of Rome. So what's the big idea about this book? What is the big idea? Acts can be neatly divided into two sections. The first dealing primarily with the ministry of Peter in Jerusalem and Samaria, as we saw in the video, Acts 1 to 12. And the second following Paul on his missionary journeys throughout the Roman Empire, Acts 13 to 28. Acts is significant for the chronicling the spread of the gospel, not only geographically, but also culturally. It records the transition from taking the gospel to an exclusively Jewish audience, with Peter preaching to a small group in the upper room, to the gospel going out among the Gentiles, primarily under the ministry of the Apostle Paul. The title of the book of Acts comes from the Greek word praxis, a word often used in the early church Christian literature to describe the great deeds of the apostles or other significant believers. This title accurately reflects the contents of the book, which is a series of brief accounts chronicling the lives of key apostles, especially Peter and Paul, in the decades immediately following Christ's ascension into heaven. So if we turn to Acts 1, verse 4 to 8, we're going to go through three or four passages of Scripture, Acts 1 and 2. We're going to walk through them, and we're going to find out a practical response. See, I believe 20 years ago, when I came back to God, I didn't have much to give God. I didn't have much stories about God. I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't know much scripture. And when I, when I came into this beautiful family, they threw me straight into the deep end and they said, we run youth group Friday nights, come and have a go. I bought four teaching series from Joyce Meyer, How to Hear the Voice of God, Finding, Fulfilling Your Dis Destiny, one about eagles and another about God's plan for your life. 
I had no prior training. I just had 20 years of ups and downs, and I had my four series. And my first Friday night with this group of young people in a living room who I felt I didn't have much to offer, I spent days listening on cassettes, how to hear the voice of God. And she mentioned seven things, how to hear the voice of God, of which I still use today to talk to young people and older people how the seven ways that God talks to us. But I really relate to the book of Acts because we have all these people that met with Jesus, these disciples, and they didn't have the book of Acts to read through as a manual. They didn't have the epistles that were written to the other churches. They had the Old Testament and they had the Holy Spirit. And that was enough for them. So I figured that was enough for me, starting off running youth group and every week trying to catch up to save this city for Jesus Christ. And so as we read Acts 1, 4 to 8, it says the Holy Spirit promised, and it says this, and being assembled together with them, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which with the Father has put in his own authority. So we'll pause there. The first part of that scripture as we go back to Acts 1, 4. I love this, I love this, I love this. It says, do not depart, but wait for your promise. Never depart, but always wait for your promise for the Father. What we get out of this as a church, because I'm all about the practical workings of Christianity. If you spend enough time around me and around people that I've spent some time with and shared my heart with, I'm all about the practical outcome of Christianity. I believe the Word of God is rich, it's true, it's great, but it's there to be practically outworked in your home, in my home, in my kids' primary school, in their high school to come, in my business, wherever I go, the gospel and its truth must be practically outworked. I'm not a big believer in getting so much training and then sitting on our hands. I'm believing in finding out some truth and go apply it the next day. Find out the truth, and we see this in the Bible, and I love this. And as a Christian, get used to doing this, assembling together and commanding them not to depart from Jerusalem, but we wait for the promise of the Father. We need to do that in all our life groups. There needs to be a time in our life groups, and incidentally, for this month, I'd like every life group to make sure that we have communion as a life group every week that you meet together to supercharge the life group, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so what we need to do as Christians is we wait together for God's promises and we remind each other the God's promises all the time, remind each other. That's what a good life group is all about, reminding and remembering the promises of God. And then it says, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So isn't it amazing how Jesus went to heaven? Like, I don't know about you, but I think the greatest gift on earth would be to have Jesus as my best friend physically here right now. We go in the car together. We go to Subway together. We go home together. And I just have Jesus physically walking beside me like, what is better than that? You would probably in some ways like to think, how can you beat that? But Jesus said, I can beat that. I can beat that. What's better than Jesus physically beside you every day, physically like disciples? He goes to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and then we get baptized in the Holy Spirit. 
who we are drenched with power and living a life where we hear from him every single day. Jesus said that is better than him staying on the earth and walking with us. Then it says in Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power, and that is dynamite, explosive power. Dynamite, explosive power. Comes from the Greek word dunamis, where we get our word dynamite. It says, but you shall receive dynamite, explosive nuclear power power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me. So why do we have this power when the Holy Spirit has come upon us is to be a witness to Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria. And my question to you is if you have the Holy Spirit, which when you're born again, it's like getting cling wrap and wrapping Joe up and sealing him for the day of redemption that's being born again. He is sealed, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to drench him with power. Why? To be a witness. When you go home, you're a witness. When you go to work, you've been given power to be a witness. Not to bow down to the culture of things in, in other people's homes. Not to bow down to the culture of government and schools that go against the teaching and the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is there to give you power to be a witness, to be a light in darkness. Don't let darkness overcome your light. Allow the Holy Spirit to give you the power to overcome darkness. That's why He's given us power. I've written some practical applications out of this first passage. The Christian life has always been about coming together, community, first of all. Do not neglect community being together it was a blueprint for the apostles and the disciples it is a blueprint for christians to come together and work through life with the holy spirit the second thing is when you receive the holy spirit did you receive his power how are you displaying this power do you walk in this power how are you and i practically displaying the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How are we doing it? How are we doing it? You shall be witnesses and at home and moving outwards. Was that a suggestion? Was that a suggestion? The thing I love about the book of Acts is it takes no prisoners. Everybody gets the finger pointed at them. Everybody gets the finger of God and everybody says, you know, gets asked a question, is Jesus asking us, is this just a suggestion? Is it only for a select few? Was there an escape, an excuse, or an exclusion, exclusion clause for any of us in that passage? Do some of us get baptized in the Holy Spirit and then go, oh, but that's not for me because I'm tired or I read something bad on Facebook or someone cut me off on the road. Uh, I'm not going to be a witness. No, we're called to be a witness every day. We're drenched with dynamite power. You are drenched. You are anointed. You are saved. You are a child of God. You're drenched with the power of God to be a witness to Jerusalem for your home, for the next stage, and to the ends of the earth. How do you show your witness to the world? Back in that time... There was next to no immediate resources on how to be a witness. Did you know that? Back in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, the Holy Spirit fell and you couldn't Google your way into being a witness for God. We had something much better than Google and YouTube and Facebook and Snapchat and Pinterest. We had, we, they had the Holy Spirit Himself. And all they had to do was engage and power up with the Holy Spirit. And then they are released to do what they need to do. On the job training. They just had the Holy Spirit and He was more than enough. Now we look. Jesus ascends to heaven. Acts 1, 9 to 11. Now Jesus had spoken those things while they watched. He was taken up. A cloud received Him out of their sight. 
They looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up. Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So this is the, a short part, and I've just got a major question in this part. And I love this question. It says, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? You see, religion wants you to stay on the cross and never get off. Religion wants to keep you on the cross and tell you all the reasons why you're not good enough and why you can't get off the cross. And it reminds me of that scripture where Jesus came up to some disciples and some people had died. And Jesus said to them, just let the dead bury themselves and come follow me. And it says here, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? I think the part of the problem is that in our New Testament, in our 21st century churches, there are so many believers that they're just standing watching heaven. They read their Bible, they get revelation, and then they gaze up to heaven. Then the neighbor to their right is struggling and going down the tube. They read their Bible, they get revelation. So many Christians do this, and then they just gaze at heaven. And if you're going to get one main theme out of the book of Acts is these men were unqualified. Only one of them, one of them died in old age. Only one of them died in old age. The other 11 let Jesus down somehow. 11 out of 12. But then we have a turnaround with the Holy Spirit. And all these men got it together, filled with dynamite power. And they're not stuck like so many of us used to be or maybe are now, just stuck with gaze up to heaven. God is looking for a church that will learn something and do something. Learn something and help somebody. Learn something and go out and change the atmosphere. Cast out a demon. Lead somebody to Jesus Christ. That is what our Christianity is all about. God doesn't want you stuck gazing up at heaven. Get on with it. Go out and bear fruit. Go into all the world. It's almost like Jesus is saying to us today, don't be gazed on heaven so much. Go out into all the world and make disciples. Go into the world. Stop gazing at every beautiful thing in heaven. Go out, make disciples so other people can reflect on heaven every now and then. And so this same Jesus speaks of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay, the upper room, Acts 12 to 14. Acts 1, 12 to 14. And we can read this. Then they return to Jerusalem. It's got all the names of who was there. Then it goes to these all continued with one accord and supplication. Supplication. With the women and Mary, the mother Jesus, and with his brothers. Practical application. They continued unity and prayer and supplication. What's supplication? The action of asking or begging for something earnestly or humbly. So get this. They so desperately, there was no manual, there was no classes, there was no anything. There was none of that. They just knew they had to wait together for a new experience Nobody had ever experienced this thing. Nobody had ever experienced the tongues of fire and the rushing wind. That was a new thing that God was about to do. But you know what made sure it happened? The thing that made sure it happened was they continued unity in prayer and supplication. In my home with my wife and my children, I need unity. In my workplace... I need unity, no strife. In our church, 
my relationship with all my departments, my worship leaders, leaders of that. I need unity for the Holy Spirit to turn up like it did back in the book of Acts. It needs to show up. I need unity. I need unity with all of us together on the same page. That's how the Holy Spirit turns up. Persistence for the cause of Christ. Persistence for the things of God. And the last passage we'll quickly mention today, coming of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2, 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost, pent meaning five, 50 days after Passover, that's where we get the name Pentecost from, 50 days after the feast of Passover had fully come. Can I just say this to us as a church? We need to be a fully come church. We need to be a fully come church. Fully come church. You look at God. He didn't come half an hour before, an hour before, 12 hours before. He is a fully come God. If my people who are called by my name will seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, will humble themselves, I will hear from heaven and heal their land. God has a process. And for many of us, after this service, if we want the Holy Spirit to show up, maybe you need to go home and apologize to a parent. Maybe you need to go home and apologize to a son or a daughter, brother or sister. Maybe you need to go home and apologize to a colleague. Not because I asked you to, but because the Holy Spirit has prompted me to do this. One of the most beautiful, beautiful things I love about my son, Seth, is if there is a hint of disconnection with me and him and he knows that he has caused it, he straight away comes up to me and says, Dad, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And the first thing, first thing I say, I put my hand on his head or his shoulder, I say, Seth, it's okay, no problem. I love you. I love you, Seth. We're one, Every, everything's okay, made a mistake. But you see, God is a fully come God, and we have to be careful that we can go out and ask God for all the provision. But if we have wrong relationships with people, God cannot fully come into every area of your life. If you have got wrong thought patterns that are habitual, that keep going on, if you've got wrong TV shows, wrong music, wrong relationships, wrong behavior, God will continue to bless you in certain areas, but he will not be able to fully come in certain areas that you most crave the breakthrough on because God is a fully come God. And like we saw in the book of Acts, he wants us all on the same page. And then we read on, They were again it says, they were all in one accord in one place. If you read those two chapters, it says at least three times the people had to be in one accord. God resists the proud. If you're not in one accord with each other, if we're not in one accord with each other, God will resist us. He'll resist the proud that are too good to make peace with each other. He, he, he won't do it. And suddenly, look at that, day of Pentecost had fully come the conditions were right, the day was right, the time was right, they're in one accord, seeking, begging, crying out to God, they're in one accord, and suddenly they came from heaven like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house they were sitting. See, when we're together, and when we do what God has asked us to do, He fully comes, it will fill our house. What? will your home look like when God has filled it with his presence? When God fills your house, there is no more strife. When God fills your house, there is no more sickness. When God fills your house, there is love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, self-control. The presence of God comes and you have that ah moment. Ah, I'm there with you, God. I've got it right. I'm filled. Home's looking good. And we work from our home outwards. If there's anything in our homes that displease God, I guarantee you 
God cannot fully come in every area of your life. He just cannot do it because he'll break his own word. And God is not a liar. God is not a liar. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So in closing, I'm going to say this. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Thank you, Joe. As the Spirit gave them utterance. It's funny, isn't it? They were all together, 120 in the upper room. They were all filled. All seeking God, they were all filled and spoke with other tongues. It doesn't say some were filled. And if God is going to fill everybody in that room, in that time, why wouldn't God want to fill all of us with His Holy Spirit? Why wouldn't God fill us? If my son asked for bread, would I give him a stone? Would I give him a snake? The Bible says. No, I would give him the Holy Spirit. So I want to encourage you today. And these are things that we can all do. These are things that we can all do. It's not that hard at the end of the day. These are all things to do. We gather together. And I want to encourage you. Want to encourage, keep your accounts short with each other. If you've got a problem with someone at home or in church, find a righteous way of fixing that relationship up. Because if we don't fix the relationships up with each other, how will God fully come? We're worshipping, we're crying out, I'm a child of God. But we haven't made other areas of our life right. We're singing, I'm a child of God, and says, God is saying to us as a church, I want to fully come in every room of your life, but you've got to start to do what I asked you to do back in the previous chapter of your life. Go and do that. Maybe there's someone you should be honoring more that you have dishonored. Maybe someone is due for honor that you've totally forgot to honor. But do those things so God can fully come. I read this last sentence and we'll pray. The apostles had the Old Testament writings, stories, teachings of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. There was no book of Acts written to follow or epistles for guidance. No church growth seminars, no Google searches, no books written to the New Testament at the time. They had to fully rely on the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth about Jesus going to ask for a response for a salvation prayer but Jesus talks about the wine and the wineskins the wine is Jesus and the wineskins are the processes let us never be guilty as a church to focus so much about the systems in our church that we forget about the one we created the systems for at the end of the day the apostles and the disciples in the book of acts they were so focused on pleasing god they were so focused on the holy spirit that other things started to fit in the way it was meant to if you'd like to close your eyes and bow your head please jesus said i'm the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through 